Rock. Wow, that kind of feels weird. Rocking. Rocking in Utah. Whoa! <laughs> Horse country. <laughs> no, but seriously, living up here in Bountiful, I have found myself bountiful. <laughs> I mean, can you believe it? I left California and now I'm drinking a smoothie. Homemade. What's up with that? <laughs> Unbelievable. Where's my Pepsi? But seriously, a lot of changes have happened just recently that have been phenomenal and amazing that God has done. He's brought me from out of California to Utah. And my wife keeps teasing me because I keep coming up with all kinds of enunciations and pronunciations for Utah. Utah! <laughs> Ute! Oot, oot, ah. You know, kind of goofing around because one of the things we do with video is we can't take life too seriously because, after all, this isn't real life, is it? This is just kind of what we're passing through in order to get to do what it is that God wants to do with us when we finally get where we're going, which is in heaven. Now, Having said that, of course, we do have a purpose and a function to accomplish that with which he has planned for us today. And today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, as it says in the provocation. But I like to think that, hey, you know what? What's the worst that can happen to you? Die? No, of course not. Oh, sure, your physical body dies, but guess what? You go home to heaven. Heaven is your home. You don't belong here. As a matter of fact, I got news for you. Most of what you do that you think is so important in this life doesn't amount to a hill of beings in heaven. Jesus said it this way, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things would be added unto you. And all these things were those things with which previously had been mentioned in the scriptures. I just recently heard a person tell me that you know, something wasn't mentioned in the scripture and I thought well yeah but that's okay I mean maybe it wasn't mentioned to you but whenever you see something that says seek ye first the kingdom of God all these things will be added to you he already has referred to it in the previous part of the scripture just look a little bit a few verses before and maybe a few verses after and you'll find the answer to anything you want to know about scripture the scripture always answers the scripture believe me it's not left vague but you see, there's also this aspect of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us wisdom. He's the one who is the spirit of wisdom. So he gives of himself in order for our brain to make connections. Now, let me put it into you in a way of physiology. You know, the way our, our brains work, the way the function of the mental aspects of what's going on inside your, your synopsis. You see, you got this kind of like electrode on one side and you got this other electrode on the other side and they don't touch. In between that, you have chemicals. Now, those chemicals can conduct electricity. Now, when you see these two electrodes, you know, and the chemicals right in between, and you send up a thought through this side of the nerve and a thought through that side of the nerve, all of a sudden a spark jumps from one to the other. Now, those two sparks, that spark jumping from one side to the other, is what creates a thought process. It begins and initiates a process with which inside your stored memories, your brain says, hey, that, and what it's looking at, is a door. And it tells you it's a door and it interprets it for you and your brain goes, oh, blah, 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 you know, and operates boom, 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 like a microcomputer, only faster. And it tells you it's a door. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit does between the physical body and the spiritual body. You see, the Holy Spirit is that chemical in between that causes the connection between your physical self and your spiritual self. That's why you kind of don't really have a full appreciation of the spiritual things of God unless the Holy Spirit, you become more and more walking in the Spirit, but unless the Holy Spirit reveals it to you, you haven't a clue what's really going on. You're still kind of like in the flesh and you know, kind of operating according to the physical world. You know, the things that you can see with your eye, not spiritually see. The things that you can hear with your ear, not spiritually hear. And the things that you can handle with your physical hands, not with your spiritual capabilities. 
So you see, there's more to life than what you think there is. There's more to living than what you really have been experiencing so far. The longer you walk with God, the more that you determine to seek God and His kingdom, the spiritual world, then the less you'll be entangled and caught up in the world and its ways, the less you'll be caught up in the emotions and devotions of the world, which is like politics and, you know, trying humanism and trying government and you know, all these worthless, meaningless endeavors that, well, you know, they may be good for providing some income, but really they don't account for much in the kingdom of God. Except for maybe if you, you know, choose to use them in some way that God has told you to, to accomplish His will and His purpose, even as Mordecai and Esther did so. But you see, even Esther got caught up in politics and she was worried more about her life than she was about, quite frankly, saving the entire Jewish nation. So Mordecai had to remember, hey look, God can use you, but even if he doesn't use you, he will use someone else to save the Jewish people. But if he's told you to do something and you don't do it, he will wipe you out from every memory and trace that you ever existed. Whoa, oh, so, that's why Jesus said, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. And my commandments are easy, and he says what they are, love, and that's about it. You know, love and do. I mean, it's pretty easy. Most people really want to do their own thing. They want to act their own way. They want to create do, do, you know, because Jesus said do, but they want to add a do to it, their own. So you have what Jesus says as do, then you have what you want to do, which is do, so you have doo-doo. That's how you make doo-doo. You know, not doing Jesus' will, but doing your will with God's will. Mix them together, and something sticks. Sorry, that's just the way it is. So you really don't want to mix metaphors, and you really don't want to confuse the world with God's will. Because the world and its ways are very much what we're used to every day. We're used to doing our own thing, seeking our own will, doing our way of appreciating and approaching life every day. Putting on our pants, as it were. Running off to our job. Doing what we think we have to do instead of what God says to do. You see, if you start your day every day with the Lord your God, He could lead you in the way that you should go. Because... As it says in the provocation, you know, today harden not your heart, but listen, obey, do as God would lead you today. And he will instruct you when to go forward, when to stand still. He'll whisper in your ear when to turn to the left, when to turn to the right. He will be as obvious about it as a pillar of fire by night and a cloud of smoke by day. If you choose you choose to walk in his way. And that's what happens with that spiritual aspect of the connections that's going on in your brain. You see, God says to change your mind. He wants to transform it. He wants to conform it to his way of thinking. He says as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are his thoughts above your thoughts and his ways above your ways. That you can't even come close to appreciating all that he is doing, or even all that he has in store for you. As a matter of fact, he says that I has not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them. And you realize that that means every day there's something new? Every day God has that in store for you? Every day you could appreciate the spiritual aspects of the reality of life you're living and go far beyond what you think of as abundancy to something that's bountiful in a way of enjoying the goodness of God. I will tell you that I have been moved into a bountiful position, so to speak, not just in where I'm living, the city of Bountiful, but rather abounding in the grace of God for every good work with which he has planned out for me to do. Whatsoever I have put my hand to, I have prospered. Whatsoever I have chosen to do in the Lord has been accomplished. He doeth all things well is one of the promises that God has said. And I don't claim it. I don't name it. I just look afterwards and say, Huh, you're right, Lord. It worked out that way. I mean, it wasn't like I was the greatest, but I wasn't the least. I was bountiful, or I abounded, or I was capable and accomplished much in everything that I've laid my hand to. 
And you know, I like that because that means that God is the one who's in control, not me. That means that God is the one who can bless, not me. That means God is the one who is working at will, His will, to do and to accomplish His good will in me for His own purposes so that I am being the fulfillment of what I was created to be. I was created for His good pleasure. And so in that, because Jesus has died on the cross and Jesus, the Father of Jesus looked down from heaven and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I will please, I want to be what I was created to be. I want to be who God has made me to be. I want to be what God created me as a creation to become. And that's to be like Jesus. To be pleasing in God's sight. To accomplish His will, even as Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen? I mean, so be it. Let's do it. Why not? That's what you were designed for. That's what your purpose is in life. Everybody likes to make out this grand purpose of some other you know, gifting or some other ministry or something that you're supposed to do. The simple fact of the matter is that every day there's one design that you were made for. To be loved and to love. And that's what Jesus said. This will fulfill the commandments. This will fulfill everything that God has said for you to do. Love and be loved. Pretty easy, or so it seems. Because you see, Jesus said, love your enemies, which obviously love isn't shooting your enemy. Love isn't killing your enemy. As a matter of fact, love isn't destroying your enemy. Love is saying, hey, come on, honey, you can walk by. People will say hi. Matter of fact, there goes my wife. She's going to answer the phone or she's going to go right in the bedroom. She's, oh, no, I don't want to interrupt. Why not? You know, I don't answer it because here I am doing the will of God, accomplishing the purposes of the God by the Spirit of God. And as He leads, so we go. And so the beauty of what God has created you to be every day is accomplished in that with which God tells you to do. Whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, that you should do. So how do you know what is the will of God for you? You were created to love and to be loved. You were created to listen to His voice. You were created to have fellowship with him. You were created to converse with him, to talk to him. And conversely, Jesus said something along those lines that's very interesting that Christians forget today. He said, my sheep hear my voice. Oh, we like to say dogmatically, with a dogma, not a doctrine, that to hear God's voice is to read his word. Well, no, to hear God's voice is to hear God's voice. To read his word is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is the perfect and acceptable will of God in Christ Jesus. We use our reading and our studying in order to apply and reformat and reprogram our brain and our conscience so that we would be filled with the word of God, that we would know God's word and God's will in the way that it was written. But likewise, Jesus made a promise. As I am leaving you now, he said, I will give you another comforter, another person as personal, intimate, and as real as you and I are right now. He will not speak of himself, but he will speak of me. And that's who the Holy Spirit as the comforter is. You see, a lot of people like to get into the presence. You know, they're kind of into this presence thing. A lot of people like to get into the gifts, and they're into the Holy Spirit gifts things. A lot of people like to get into the Holy Spirit, and they're like, holy cow. But you know, Really, the Spirit of God, greater than all of these things, doesn't talk. He reminds us of Jesus. He confronts and instructs us of the Word of God. He is really that chemical between those two thought processes with which we are transferred from our physical world to our spiritual world, and He causes us to know the things of the Spirit, for they are spiritually discerned. The reality of the Holy Spirit is greater than what people in all these different ways of describing him are and lesser than what they think that it is because a lot of times they worship that part of who the Holy Spirit is and he's so much more but the beauty of who the Holy Spirit is is so overtly humble that we are not to exalt him but rather we are to allow him to remind us, to instruct us, to direct us to Jesus. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He fills us so that we could be full of the Spirit of God, full of God Himself 
in direct communication with God so that we would, and we should, hear his voice. Because Jesus promised that. And that's why he sent the Comforter. That's why Peter was so different after the fact of the Spirit of God. Now, admittedly, in Acts, you know, they were kind of working it out. You know, it's like, wow, how do we live in a practical world with a spiritual aspect to our lives that we really don't know how to make the two work? And today, the same thing is true. So we need to seek the Lord daily to walk in his way, to walk in his word, but also to walk in his will. So if we walk in his will, we need to ask him, Lord, what is your will today? What is your will for me today? Which we've already identified as one thing. To love the Lord your God. To be loved and to love. To love those that are around you, those whom he died for. And so if you do, then if you love someone, you spend time with them. You communicate with them. You talk to them. You have relationship with them. Because a love and a lover, the recipient of love also is the giver of love, back and forth. That indicates that there is a relational type of intercourse between the two people that are loved and being loved. And the reality is so too with your brother and your sister. Likewise, even as the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are one, we are called to be one with ourselves, one with God, and one with our brethren. Tripartite. Interesting, isn't it? So, when we go forward each day, choosing to live our lives according to the will of God, the word of God, and the way that Jesus said to, then it's not just love, because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that being, the love would be demonstrated as our fulfillment of his commandment to us. The fulfillment of all the law on the prophets. The fulfillment of everything that God wanted for us. But there's something that the Father wanted from us that possibly you haven't really heard of before. Jesus prayed that they may be one as he and the Father are one, but he also prayed something more. Go back and read that prayer when he prayed for his disciples and you'll see something interesting. He said, Father, I would that they know you as I know you. Do you know the Father? Do you know your Father in heaven? Is he so holy that you have to be distant from him? Or is he so loving that you receive from him the compassion and the mercy, the grace to come boldly into his throne room and to say, Father, here I am. Show me, reveal to me, teach me, instruct me, guide me in the way as you go. Good question. So let's look at the Word today. Let's go with the light that we've been given, which is the Word. So, as much as we don't want to get into too much spiritual stuff, let's just read the Word and find out what God would say to us today. Let us allow the Spirit of God to give unction, to give providence, to give all those King Jameth's words to us in a way that we would understand, comprehend, and be able to use for our day today. As we could walk forward in a developing relationship that goes beyond what we can see, what we can touch, what we can feel, but that we could see with spiritual eyes and see the kingdom of heaven here right now. That we could hear God's voice, not just hear the things that are background noise of the world and its ways. That we could know his way, that we would walk therein, not just to know what Jesus said, but to have Jesus speak to us directly today and know what his will is in the way that we should go. And as we do in video, and now in Utah video, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, abhor that which is evil, abstain from all appearance of evil, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Jesus our Passover is sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let a man examine himself, and, let, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of that cup. Let everyone that nameth the name of Jesus depart from iniquity. Such an high priest became us, 
who is wholly harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. In him is no sin. Having been brought into a better priesthood, having been brought into a more satisfying sacrifice, having been made into the likeness of the Son of Jesus, Son of Man, the Son of God, Jesus himself, ought we not to put aside our sinfulness? Ought we not to lay aside the world in its ways? Ought we not to walk in a more excellent way? Should we choose this day to walk in the word that we just heard, then I would say to you, this is the day the Lord has made, and he does cause the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the wicked and the good, but let us not be as the wicked man in his ways. Let us rather be an example of someone who has put away the old leaven, the sinfulness, the things we used to do, the things we were so consumed with, the things that puffed us up and made us lifted up higher than we ought to be. Let us humble ourselves as the Holy Spirit is. Let us be tender as Jesus was. Let us be so sensitive that we don't even know how awesome the very heart of God, our Father, is and how intimate He wants to be with you right now. For surely in our sufferings, as Jesus suffered, we are made obedient, even as He was. Surely in our pain and our scars, we are reminded of His mercy and grace, even as Jesus was, as He bears the scars today. Oh, let us not forsake such great, a precious gift of salvation that's been availed to us so that we could freely receive of it and drink of the waters of living life, that we would go forward not just with living water, but that we would have an abundant, abounding, bountiful life, that we would be not so of the world, but also of the Spirit, that we would be so spiritually minded that we're all earthly good. And I am, and you are, if you will walk in His Word, walk in His way, and walk in His will today.